Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 115 of the J Situation podcast. I'm recording this on May 31st, 2022. How are you wonderful folks doing on this beautiful day? <laughs> I'm doing well. I am getting back into the swing of things. Uh, you know, Memorial Day weekend, it was a long weekend, and uh, now everything is compressed. Yeah. <laughs> so dealing with that. I just got back from the NRA annual meeting convention in a good old H-Town. That's right, Houston, Texas. Yeah. Uh, I like the show this year. It w- It was pretty good. It was good to see a lot of industry folks I hadn't seen in a while, and it was good to meet up with some consumers and podcast listeners, too. That was really cool. That was really fun. It was. You know, I even had some time with uh, Mr. Brandon Herrera, the the AK guy. Yeah, he does AK stuff. And so he's a really nice guy, and, you know, if you like AKs, he's probably probably worth checking out, I think. Yeah, I mean, maybe I can learn learn about AKs from him uh, so that I can fully understand uh, the, the culture and immerse myself so that I can provide you with data that matters. <laughs> you know, Silencer Shop had a presence at the show as well. It was good to see those folks there. They always have a fairly large contingent at shows like that, so that was cool. And you know, they just so happened to be one of the folks helping to support this effort. That's right. The J Situation Podcast is proudly sponsored by Silencer Shop. You can use their kiosk, do your fingerprints and photos electronically. And really, in turn, you're cutting down on errors. You're, you're simplify, simplifying your silencer purchasing process. You get a money-back guarantee. It's great. No transfer fees. No paperwork errors. Just you and your silencer with no drama. It truly is silencer ownership simplified. That's right. And secondly... This podcast is also brought to you by True Shot Gun Club out of Arizona. And, you know, I was able to meet with uh, those folks at the show as well. Man, that was really cool. Good dudes, I tell you what. And how do they support? Well, it's simple. You click the link in the show notes um, or on the website. Um, you know, for each episode here of the podcast, there's a link in there. and It'll take you to their site. If you buy ammo using that link, it helps the podcast. And it helps Pew Science. So it's pretty simple. Just got to click that link. Now, if you also want to join their club, their A-Zone membership, uh, if if you join that club, you get free shipping on all of your ammo that you buy over an entire year. If that sounds cool to you, if you use the code word Pew Science on their website, you get $20 off that membership. So that's pretty cool. You win, they win. You help the podcast. That's right. Hope that helps you. And lastly... And definitely, most importantly, this podcast is brought to you by Pew Science, pushing the science industry forward one test at a time. That's right. You can visit PewScience.com for the suppression rating. It's the simplest and the most accurate hearing safe ratings for your suppressed small arms based on true human inner ear response from the entire gunshot from before combustion takes place all the way until all the combustion is gone. That's the important part. We consider the entire gunshot. We really want to know, how does this affect your ears in the entirety? So we can compare everything. Knowledge is power, that's right. And the suppression rating is in section 5 of the silencer sound standard, okay? Uh, Basically, the silencer sound standard on PewScience.com is going to walk you through gunshot noise. It's sort of like Wikipedia, but it's cooler because it's about silencers. There's seven parts. They're all on the website for you to read. And if you haven't seen it, that's fine. Skip directly to the suppression rating in section five. It's going to let you know how silencers stack up in comparison to one another with regard to sound at the muzzle and the shooter's ear. And it gives you a hearing safe dose limit for the particular platforms on which the silencers are tested. Okay, it's directly tied to human inner ear response. If the rating is higher, it's probably going to sound better to you or more pleasing. And it's going to be less, uh, you're going to have less hearing damage risk. If the rating is lower, it's probably going to sound louder or more harsh, and it's going to increase the risk of damage to your hearing. That's really all there is to it, and you're not going to find this information anywhere else. The sixth section of the standard contains all the reviews. I know it can be quite overwhelming. You might say, Jay, what is this? Some kind of college course on silencers? Why are you uh, so crazy? I say, well, there's a lot of reasons for that. <laughs> Don't get me started. But, uh, you know, if that's too much for you, that's fine. Um what you can do um, 
you can go all the way to section seven of the standard and there's a summary table that's called rankings that's right simple database tool you can sort and view the suppression ratings of all the publicly released test data yeah then there's links in the table to the individual reviews uh, so it'll take you back to section six and you can go wild as always, if you are a manufacturer and you would like to use PewScience for private testing and consulting services, there is a form on the website with which you can submit that inquiry. Your contact information and all test data will be held in strict confidence, unless, of course, uh, you want to release it to the public. You want me to publish it for you there on the website, in which case I, I can certainly help you do that, and that happens a lot. More and more now uh, companies are taking advantage of that service, and I'm glad to see it. I think the industry is glad to see it, too. You can support this podcast, PewScience, and all the testing I do by joining with a membership at PewScience.com. There's also a, a donate function on the website. If you're, if you're not keen on monthly fees, you can do make a one-time donation on the review page or the podcast page there. Every little bit helps. You can give a little bit. You can give a lot of it. You can give nothing at all. And something that costs you nothing, except your time. <laughs> is uh, rating the podcast. Yeah, you can rate the podcast on Spotify. Uh, you can rate it on iTunes. That would really help because, uh, you know, that way we can let folks know that silencers and guns are awesome. I mean, normalize the use of suppressed small arms. Get that. Uh, get more eyes on the effort, and, and we can grow this thing together and make the silencer world great again. Okay, I have four topics prepared for you today. Topic one. Uh, the NRA annual meetings, short recap. Yeah, I want to give you a quick uh, recap of some, some of the stuff I saw there. Um, you know, did, did anything stand out in the silencer world? Well, you know, the, the Dead Air Sierra 5 was released, you know. And, all, and you know, uh, I think there might be some new Surefire stuff coming, so we'll talk about that. Topic two, new sound signature review this week. This week? <laughs> oh, yes. There is, friends. Uh, member research coming, too. So buckle up for that, Pew Science members. Bless you. Topic three, listener questions. That's right. Let's hit another round. I think that'll be fun. Uh, it's, it's fun for me. I enjoy it. I think you do, too. I find it useful. It's, it's good to put on the old thinking cap and, and speak about some issues that you, the listeners, are concerned with. And then topic four, you know... I will say, uh, really eye-opening meetings this past weekend at the show. Uh, you know, the support for Pew Science is non-trivial for sure, and now I feel like it's extremely tangible. You know, because the companies and the the entities and the consumer s- supporters of the effort are pretty amazing. You know, so I, I, w- I want to give a big shout out to Swiss CNC. Uh, they're a Pew Science corporate member. And they are an incredible manufacturer. So we'll talk about that in topic four. Okay. Let's move into topic one at a time of eight minutes and 10 seconds. Okay. Yeah. Topic one. Yeah. NRA annual meetings. Short recap for you here. You know, I was, I was really racking my, I was, it's funny. I, I'm playing catch up. And so. I was prepping for this podcast earlier today. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> I was I was prepping for this podcast um, about an hour or so ago, and um, I was racking my brain trying to think about anything silencer wise that stood out to me from uh, from NRA. You know, and I thought, well, did air Sierra Five, and. I had some really great conversations with Surefire. And I was like, those are the two things that I came away from NRA thinking about as a science person. You know, I'm sure there was some other stuff that I, you know, I don't know. You know, it's interesting with COVID, the big arm shows have really been few and far between, like in the past couple of years. Like the, the, the I wouldn't say the culture shift, but the, the, the logistics shifted, you know. And I didn't go to shot this year, so there was a big backlog of non-in-person time with folks. You know what I mean? Like, I I usually have a targeted hit list of what I want to check out when I go to big shows, like, gear-wise, right? Like, 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 for example, silencers. I'm like, well, I want to go to this booth because I want to see this silencer. You know, I want to look at this gun, da-da-da. 
you know, I usually, I usually do that. Now, the NRA annual meetings are what the thing is called, but the convention, you know, or, or, the, or the trade show that occurs at the event is the real attraction for most folks, right? I think, I think it's the largest consumer arms show in the United States. I, I would say, uh, it, I, I actually like it better than shot, better than shot show because the NRA is shorter. It's open to everyone, and I find that it can be pretty productive. You know, shot's cool because you get to speak with you know a lot of suppliers and manufacturers and stuff. But you know, you can also do some of that at NRA, and having consumers there is cool. So the, the, I guess there's pluses and minuses to both. So this year, my hit list for you know the products and the gear, it really, it really wasn't gear related. It was is more relationship driven. I, I wanted touch points with the folks I hadn't seen in a while uh, or, or I hadn't met before. And I will say, I will say the mission was successful. It, if you are a consumer or someone in the industry even, I, I highly recommend going to shows like that, man, just to put faces with names. It can be good. Yeah, even if you don't, you know, maybe you're in the industry, you don't sell a product or anything, or you're just, you're doing the stuff. I mean, meeting people in person can be really great. And so it had been so long that, man, you, sometimes you forget how valuable the inter, in-person interaction can be. So th- that's that's really like one of the main reasons I went. Now I did see the Dead Air Sierra Five. Um, it's it's neat that you know it's funny. <laughs> it's neat that I can talk about this silencer now. I I held prototypes of this thing a year ago, guys. Like I've already, you know I've already known about the Sierra Five. I have pictures. I'll probably post some pictures of it of some early prototypes um i saw a while back me and uh, me and todd mcgee were messing with powerful todd mcgee shout out sir um yeah so the sierra 5 is a, a dedicated 556 silencer from dead air uh stellite baffle stack and a uh, fairly compact in size which is one of the things i'm excited about frankly just you know looking at the spec sheet you know just objectively i i I think the size is going to be interesting. Um, it will definitely be interesting to see how the performance of the silencer stacks up, especially on the Mark 18, when compared to other offerings on the market. Right now, we have we have so much context now, so I'm super stoked actually um, to, to to evaluate this thing. Whenever that happens, I think it'll be cool to to see what it does. I think that'll be really cool. You know. What's funny, we have a we have quite a lot of systems in the current published data set, and the data set's grown every day. It really is. So, you know, we're really discovering how baffle designs and their configurations influence 556 behavior. And, and and we're doing that, you know, in a way that well, what Particularly, what's interesting is is the short barrel factor. I think that's really what we're seeing too, and so we're definitely we're definitely seeing that the short barrel five five six platform is a different animal than seven six two NATO. I mean, it's a completely different animal in some respects, isn't it? It's interesting, right? It's def- it's definitely different, and automatic actions are significantly different than bolt actions. I mean, I know that that statement's like, duh, of course it is. But yeah, but you're seeing it in the data now. You're seeing what 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 can change, and and that that monkey wrench, it's high, it's highlighting performance attributes, isn't it? Like of the different systems, it it's it starting to say, oh, man, we saw the Omega metric with seven six two. Well. That's interesting. I wonder what the practical consequence of flow restriction can be. And then you see these other silencers and you're like, oh, flow restriction can can change, change things, you know, it can. So, you know, I think about the Sierra 5, I don't know. I don't have, I don't have dimensions and drawings of the internals and you know, I, don't, I don't know what it's going to do, you know. I, I looked inside it at the show. I don't know what it's going to do. We'll have to see. That's why we test things, right? We have to. We have to understand. We have to understand the performance. You know, I, I posted. I posted a couple stories on social media <laughs> today, actually, <laughs> where consumers had commented 
to me, and I, I just reposted the conversations, right? They commented to me with their experience with the Otter Creek Labs polonium. You know, with regard to gassiness or so-called blowback, right, on their ARs. Okay, so these guys are, they have they have a polonium for however they got it. I mean, the thing just came out. Maybe they got their forms approved. They have these poloniums. They're putting it on their ARs, and they're talking about the back pressure, you know. And the reason I think today they started having some of those conversations with me was because I reposted a meme that someone made where they tagged me, and it was a video from American Psycho with Christian Bale. <laughs> and I'm a sucker for a good American Psycho meme, so of course I'm reposting that. Um, I'm only human, right? So, But yeah, the, the meme was about flow rate and back pressure, okay? High back pressure silencers are going to increase the likelihood of blowback on the AR reciprocating system, and there's really nothing you can do about that. Okay, because it's a fit, it's physics, and, and and it just happens. Now you can change a few variables. Okay, you you can you can doctor your system. You can tune your AR. Okay, you well one thing you can do if we're talking about the whole system. Well, you can change the silencer. <laughs> you don't have to use a high back pressure silencer. That you have choices. Okay, so you can do that. That's one way to increase flow rate. Then you can like you know basically chase the problem at the source, you know, the flow restriction hanging off the end of the muzzle there, you know. Now, you can also, now let's say you're stuck with a silencer or you've picked a silencer you want to stick with. Well, you you can you can reduce your rate of fire to reduce what we call gas stack. And actually gas stack is a, it's a very crude term, but I think that's something we're going to be talking about here in the next couple of weeks as I release some data for you. But, um, you know, you can reduce the rate of fire um, that's one way to to deal with blowback caused by high back pressure on the AR. You, you know you can you you can reduce the dwell time. You know, of your system, you 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 can reduce the dwell time of the uh, in 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 the barrel there with 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 the gas port location. How do you do that? Well, you can move your gas port towards your muzzle. You can do that. What does that do? Well, it helps you deal with the increased dwell time from the silencer. You can you can kind of cancel out some of that increased dwell time by shortening your your the dwell time of your system before putting the silencer on there you can do that you you can you can add mass to the buffer right that's going to add inertial resistance to the reciprocating system keeps it locked longer you know you can add spring force it's going to add spring resistance you can, you can reduce your gas port size that's going to change the flow rate of gas into your gas tube and carrier unlock all of these things are messing with timing right the name of the game is messing with timing. It's it's messing with unlock time. Okay, you can, you can do all these things. These are all tuning methods, and and we can go into that sometime. We can go in more detail, but I don't. I, I didn't really plan on doing it today. I have gotten some feedback since the last episode where people are kind of interested in speaking about AR tuning. So I think we can make a good tuning episode. Speak about that stuff, but but uh. But we're not going to talk about today. But how how much will like I wanted to ask you, how much will you need to tune your gun for a polonium? Yeah. Or for a surefire RC2 or for a dead air Sierra 5. Right? It's gonna depend on the flow restriction of each of those silencers. You, you know what? Oh, that reminds me. Let me pull up, let me pull up social media right now, because this guy, I'm gonna pull up Instagram a second here. So what I get for, oh my God, this is what I get for checking my phone during a podcast. There's all kinds of notifications. It's not a good day. Okay. I post it to my story so I can read it directly. One second, one second. Okay, this dude, he put a polonium on his AR and he was telling me it was kind of gassy. He was he was moving from a um from an OS HXQD 556K. Okay, you can see that on... You can see that on the website, actually, on PSilence.com. I did review that silencer on the Mark 18. He went from that silencer to a polonium. Okay, I don't know what muzzle device he's using on his polonium, but he's using a polonium. So he, he talked about he's getting gas now. And, and, and I was like, yeah, that's... I told him in the conversation that I posted here publicly. I, I was like, yeah, that, that's... That's going to happen. That's what a high flow rate will... I mean, I'm sorry, high flow, high flow restriction will do. 
that high high back pressure will cause will cause um, adverse effects on some systems. You know, I'm trying to tell this guy that, and he said um, the rifle he's using it on. Uh, I'm reading this directly for for directly from the 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 Instagram story here. He said he got a PWS Mark 114 and had to go to an H4 buffer in setting two. So what I'm assuming his setting two means is the PWS, uh, the primary weapon systems, piston driven ARs, they they have an adjustable um, gas block for their proprietary piston system. And I'm guessing that setting two means that it is not letting a lot of gas out through the port. So he's already uh, dealing with that increased dwell time uh, from the polonium caught um, spurred on by more flow restriction and then he's using an h4 buffer so he's not only decreased the gas impulse going to the carrier he's increased the inertial resistance significantly of his bulk carry group and by using h4 buffer so h4 that's pretty heavy so uh so yeah he's done a lot um to try to mitigate that and so he what what has that gentleman done he's well he's tuned his ar hasn't he and the, I'm just, and the only reason I'm talking about that right now is because I, li- it, the conversation literally happened like an hour or two ago, or or whenever I posted that story. So, so that's like the, that's like real time feedback from, um, a, from a follower fr- from a gun person with a silencer on a weapon. Okay, so that's one example of real world AR tuning. What that guy had to deal with because his polonium has higher back pressure, more flow restriction. I mean, guys, when I started releasing test data for the Mark 18, and I showed you the Seiko review very early on, you saw that that's what can happen. So don't be surprised. Like, you know, you see these, you want you want qu- super quiet 5.56 five, silencers, what? You think they're not going to restrict flow? You can only do so much. When you get suppression ratings that are that high, the muzzle, you got to think about this. You know, I mean, you know, there, there are some limitations to physics. We can't bend space-time just yet. So, <laughs> without a lot of gravity... Um, gravity reactor. Um, you know, it really does th- this weapon tuning need and this AR system performance vector. It's really going to depend on the flow restriction uh, of these silencers and also the weapon parameters of your specific system. You know, I can tell you right now that no amount of tuning in the world is going to keep some silencer and weapon combinations from gassing you, especially during high rates of fire. And that's something people may not understand. You, 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 like, if you like shooting like one round from your AR, like, you know, every like 30 seconds or something, like that's super slow. It's, you're not going to, it's not going to, it's not going to be nearly as severe. You got to understand the difference in, in rate of fire and, and what it can do, uh, and, and how back pressure can, can create different, adverse conditions and how the, those adverse conditions or the frequency of those adverse conditions may increase upon rate of fire increasing and that's something that without a high flow rate I, I, all the tuning in the world isn't going to help you and that's because of a, because because you're you're pressurizing a dynamic pressure vessel over and over and over again it doesn't have the blowdown capacity uh, i.e flow rate i.e back pressure reduction to deal with that pressurization and that's physics you know, you, it just, this is just how it is. Now, um, we'll see how the Sierra 5 does. I'm I'm interested, you know. what You know what's also interesting about it? It has that modular back end. And that's that's probably where the industry's going now, guys. I, If everyone hasn't noticed that, man, the, all these sensors are coming out. They're having that modular back end. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Um, I don't know, man. For its size, I saw the size. I held it. For its size, I'm rooting for it, man. I mean, just as a silencer guy, I want it to be awesome. Like, I like compact 5.56 silencers. I like them. I, I love my RC2. I like it, dude. It's on my desk right now. It's sitting there. Like, <laughs> I love it, dude. Um, Yeah. So I, I feel like I feel like small footprint 5.56 silencers have good potential. I like them. I like them for the utility. I like the way they look. I think it's a it's a capable envelope. I'm not saying don't go big, but sometimes I like them when they're not huge. You know what I mean? Excuse me. So yeah, you know. 
speaking of 556 five, silencers, oh man. Surefire. Salt of the earth, those guys, I tell you what. Fantastic to meet with them in NRA. That was really cool. If you guys are listening, thank you for your time. <laughs> really, no, you spent a lot of time with me, like all levels of their company. I really appreciated it. And I, I am honored. Um, now, I, I can't tell you folks what's coming from Surefire, but boy, howdy. <laughs> boy, howdy. I'm amped, dude. Like, I'm super amped right now, actually. I'm freaking excited for what Surefire has in store. All right. I'm, I don't want to leave you completely hanging, but I, I will say this. You already know Surefire's testing in R&D is pretty world class. Like, I don't know if you know that, but yeah, they're they're pretty good. Um, well, I mean, com- when it comes to silencer companies, Surefire is pretty, uh, they're pretty good. Uh, they, they y- you if you understand testing and R&D and the effort it takes to do it and the consistency that they're requiring um, in their operations, it's pretty big deal. It's a pretty big deal. So I can tell you that out of many um, sponsor companies I, I, I've seen and, and see how they operate, Surefire does a pretty good job. I tell you what, and you, you probably you know you've probably seen videos that the, they've done at their facilities there. You can go to YouTube and um, I think Sponsor Shop did a pretty good video that that has Surefire in it. You know, featured their facility, some of the stuff they do, and their manufacturing and everything. Now. What you might not know, what you might not know is the talent they retain in R and D, and there's some dude, there's some big brain action going on there. <laughs> like I'm telling you, like I don't know, I don't even know how I was to say that. So stay tuned. I was impressed, and it it takes a lot to impress me. So I, I'm full on fanboy right now for what may come out of their shop. Uh, we'll see what the future holds. Hey. I'm a sponsor guy, just like you folks listening. I want to have cool stuff. I think we're in the golden age. So, man, we're going to see what the future holds. I'm that, that like I don't know that that's kind of the two things that I came away from NRA being excited about: the Sierra Five and 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 new Surefire stuff that's not out yet. I mean, I'm not saying there aren't other amazing things being done by other companies because there certainly are. I mean, I you know I there's just not a ton of other stuff at the show to mention right now okay because you know there are there are some things coming from several several manufacturers but but i just can't divulge it and the, you know the public knowledge isn't there to share so i can't share it but th- there's some other stuff coming too that's really cool but i think right now 556 five, silencers are hot i think they're super hot and i and i i think everyone and their mom wants to know how how to quiet their <laughs> quiet down their ar that's what i think and and i think Everyone and their mom wants to know how to do it in the most efficient manner possible. I think consumers are getting smarter. I think that the trend for efficiency is ramping up across not only new buyers, but existing buyers. And so that's the trend I'm seeing. That's what I see. If I can look into my crystal ball, but you know, I'm not sure how cloudy my crystal ball is. I try to keep it nice and clean. Speaking of, next topic, <laughs> topic two at a time of 28 minutes and 37 seconds. Okay, yeah, topic two, new sound signature review this week. Yeah, yeah, yes, friends. Member research coming too. There is. It's, it's a Pew Science member bonus round. Yeah, I moved something up uh, this week. I was actually not planning on doing it so soon, but I just felt like I needed to to, to nip it in the bud, um, and there was quite a demand. Um, sometimes that happens. I have my reasons. Now, I did it with Pew Science internal funding. You see, this is all on uh, Pew Science dime. Therefore, it is all uh, funded by you listening. That's right. Uh, everyone that supports this podcast uh, and uh, you know supports Pew Science with with a mumble, m- monthly membership there, uh, you you made this happen. So thank you. This is a direct result of consumer funding, and and uh, that's how I got it done. 
And I figured it was a good idea to do it. And, and, and to do it right, I had to write two articles. <laughs> Sometimes that happens. To do it right, I had to write two articles. So this week, uh, you, you guys will get a new review data set. And uh, members will get a supplementary article with it. Yeah. It's a short week, uh, but two publications. Pew Science. <laughs> That's right. So I think uh, what I published this week will shed some light on a recently debated industry product. Uh, somewhat of a hot topic uh, that I feel I can assist with, so I would like to do that. Um, I think that the conclusions I present uh, in not only the review, but in the member research will help people, I, I think. I think that's that's true. Also, I think there will be some conclusions that are counterintuitive. Uh, one of which I actually didn't believe at first. It was counterintuitive to me at first, uh, but the data looks correct. So it is what it is. I'm going to report it as it is. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to throw that out there, and and uh, we can learn together. Yeah. You know, I will say I just uh, I don't want to tease you too much here, but I'm trying to talk around it without letting you know what it is. You know, when folks talk about silencers, um, and they talk about them being dedicated for a platform. It, it's really often something debated pretty hastily, I would say. Like when guys talk about this, they 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 debate it quickly and they they don't have all the context when they do it. And so I would pose the question, what if there was a way to understand the performance of systems holistically? Okay, well, you know, and, and you should answer, well, there is. Because that's what Pew Science does. It's like, that's correct. Good answer. Okay. <laughs> So you guys need to think about this, okay? Like you, you get the speculation for performance without understanding how the thing performs is it can be dangerous. Now, I do have to give consumers credit, though. I was thinking about this earlier today. I, I, th- I think we all, I think we all have to give consumers a lot of credit. Not just me, but you know, manufacturers and vendors of products, you guys. I'm telling you, w- when some silencers get released. With certain characteristics, some consumers react positively or negatively because they're more informed. You see, that's right. These can, the, the, there is this group of consumers that's more informed. That you know, they're more educated. They're more knowledgeable regarding the silencer behavior. You see, so I I think this is in large part because of Pew Science. I do. So I do realize I've created an environment in which vocal consumers might be more educated. You see what I mean? Like, so you're, it's not that I'm taking educated people and making them vocal. No, 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 no. Okay, I'm taking everyone and educating them. And if you slice a slice through everyone, some of the slice is going to be vocal people. So just by the numbers, there's going to be a <laughs> there's a higher probability of everyone being educated, which means there's a higher probability of vocal people being educated. Okay. And thus, <laughs> we have a weaponized contingent of consumers. You see, we we have weaponized vocal consumers with education. So be it, okay? But I, I mean, I'm, I'm saying it directly because I think people are seeing that, and that's fine. I, I don't, it, it, in my opinion, it's better that more information proliferates than not. And and what is done with the information is not for us to decide. You know what you know what it is? It's culture. It's not for us to decide. Culture. Culture happens with stimuli. So you take away restrictions and you feed knowledge into the bucket. Well, you're gonna grow, you're gonna grow things. Okay, stay tuned this week. Yeah, probably Thursday. I'm behind. I, I've written most of it. Um, like I said, I lost a day. 
you know, it's been, it's been a short week this week. You know, I lost two days, <laughs> really. So I'm like, I'm kind of, I'm kind of behind, but I'm going to get it to you. It's going to be great. Should be cool. Okay. Yeah. So stay tuned. New data, new member research. Um, and hopefully I know not everyone will find it useful, but I think a lot of people will. Even if you don't have the silencer or want the silencer, you're going to learn something that I think blew my mind. That's right. Okay, topic three, time of 35 minutes. Man, my pen is going bad. Jesus Louise. 35. It's not even working. I'm going to throw this pen away. 35 minutes <laughs> and 26 seconds. Dang, man. It's weird. Like, I write on the piece of paper and it works. And then I move it to another piece of paper and it stops. Ah. <sighs> The intricacies. Topic three. <laughs> Let's dive back into solicitation four of listener questions, shall we? <laughs> Let's hit another round. It's always fun. Let me get a drink of water one second. This is always fun. I really like it. Uh, so, you know, you guys ask such great questions. So, this should be a good topic, I think. I had some time. I was like, you know what? I'm going to dig back into the spreadsheet. I'm going to pull it up right now. All right. Yeah. Okay. Pulling it up. Man, you should see the spreadsheet. It's kind of wild. There's a lot of questions in this. Okay. Oh, actually, I need to move that window. Make sure I don't lose the recording. Boom. Okay, we are in solici solicitation four of listener questions. Uh, last time we did this, we left off on uh, question number 225. Subquestion 28 of the solicitation, and keep in mind, guys, if you're looking to go back um, and find answers to previous questions, go ahead, you go to the website. Um, each episode on the website at pewscience.com slash podcast has metadata tags, and if you click on the listener question metadata tag that you will see on this episode that is yet to be published, that will be published in the morning, uh, this is future J. We'll publish that. If you click on that metadata tag, it will organize the episodes um, and show you only the ones with listener questions. So if you want to hear more about the ones we talked about previously, that's how you do that. Now, uh, we, the question that we, we last answered was um, this later gentleman asked, any plans for testing the Surefire Mini 2 or the SB2? And then I, I went on to answer. I said, yeah, we're probably going to test them. Uh, basically talked about priority then we, we talked about the difference between the rc2 and this sb2 and why they're different why they're similar yada yada so if you want to learn more about that go back to the previous episode with listener questions okay uh, so next question question 226 sub question 29 did you settle on a 4570 test subject and why is it the marlin 1895 sbl <laughs> I like I like those questions when people are like they ask something they're like did you do this and why is the answer this <laughs> it's funny um, thank you for the question that's a good question actually I haven't I actually have not settled on a forty five seventy test host thank you for asking uh, I have been so busy with other testing and other things uh, that that I actually let that slip a little bit thanks for reminding me oh one second oh that was not a yawn meant for you guys I'm sorry I'm just I'm dragging. <laughs> I've been so busy with other testing and stuff. I, I really appreciate the reminder of this. And, and this question actually was from a while back. So this shows you how far behind I am. Um, this is actually a current need. And it's something that I think is worth talking about. You know, I still, it's tough, man. 4570 or 450 Bushmaster. It's tough. I think, I think it's probably going to be 4570. Now, what the heck is the choice for this? And I'm, I'm going to go back into my email archives and revisit it. A lot of feedback was gotten from, from Pew Science members and from a podcast listeners. And, and it's, that was really cool. But right now, <laughs> this Mar you asking this sir or ma'am, Marlin 1895 SBL. I'm going <laughs> to, I want to Google it because I want to know what it looks like. Hold up a second. I think I know what you're talking about. Hold up. Marlin. H95 SBL. Oh, first. Okay. Their SEO is working. First result there. Oh, that's pretty. 
Okay, so I just pulled this up on uh, MarlinFirearms.com. I'm looking at a picture of it. Oh, boy, howdy. Look at that. Lever action. It's all uh, 4570 government. That's right, 4570. Look at that. It's all shiny, shiny and chrome. Well, it's not chrome. What, what is this? It's just stainless steel, right? I, I'm assuming. What is it? Nickel plated. Oh, no, nickel plated bolt. I'm scrolling down here. Yeah, stainless steel, polished stainless. Okay. It looks cool, man. You, got, you know what's cool about lever gun, right? It's like a bolt action. You only have one pressure source. Right? Say so this close you firing from a closed bolt, there's no reciprocation unless you unless you eject it manually. So you're gonna you're gonna send all of those combustion products down down the muzzle there. Through into the silencer. And this thing comes threaded. It, yeah, it's thre- what is it threaded? It's threaded 11 16th inch, uh, 24 threads per inch, okay? And it looks like it has a a nice rail on top of it. It looks like it has a ghost ring rear side, fiber optic front. It's got, yeah, it's pretty cool. It's like a laminate stock. looks kind of nice. Actually, this is like really nice, dude. Hmm. One in 20 twist, okay? Six groove rifling. Not that expensive. I should just order one of these. Huh. Yeah, man. That's dope. That's really pretty. Well, oh, wait. How long is the barrel? 19 inches? Hmm. We'll have to do some research on that, sir, ma'am. Let me... Now that I'm on their site, go to Lever Action. Let's see. Let's see what they got here. Okay. The SBL, the Trapper, the 336, the 1894... Okay, what's the what's the okay? Oh, it won't let me. Oh, it yeah, oh it it's not available anymore. So really, they just got the eighteen ninety five, the trapper and the SBL. What's the bear length on that? Is it, are they both nineteen inches? No, the trapper has a sixteen inch a sixteen point one inch barrel. Yeah, you see what I mean? That's um. It could be that we do that instead, my friends. You know, just speaking real time, this is kind of what I look at when I'm choosing a test host. Like, you know, my thought process when, when, when talking through this is, well, you know, we want a standardized gun and we also want something that's really go- going to test the limits of the silencers. We don't want to give it a t- too easy of a time. You know, you don't want to take too long of a barrel else you're getting... You're getting data that, that frankly, I mean, I know it can be useful for the people that have the barrel that long, but it doesn't it doesn't really exercise the silencer. It doesn't stretch the limitations. And frankly, when the data's out there for a long time, it's not going to push as much innovation probably. See, there's a lot of factors that I look at. Um, although it is a, a research cooperative with a lot of folks participating, it is not a democracy. <laughs> okay, so I am, I am in control of this. So... Um, so yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna give that some more thought, but maybe I do both as a sensitivity as an internal sensitivity study, publish part of that, and then continue with one because I don't really don't know. the The, the issue is there's not going to be well, not an issue, but one of the I guess something that's fortuitous is that there's not going to be as many sponsors on this test house because there's it's just it's it's not a thirty caliber sponsor situation. Understand? So that we're going to be limited. So we might be able to do it all. You know what I'm saying? Okay, I'm closing that now. But good question, sir, ma'am. Um, I really appreciate you uh, reminding me about that. And I think that, that was a useful exercise for us. So thank you. Question 227. A local question 30. What factors to consider when choosing a 22 suppressor? Oh, man. I'm going to drink water. That's a good question. I'm glad you asked. Excellent question, actually. And that's probably going to help a lot of people. Now, I'm going to say something that isn't always true, uh, but it's true a lot of the time. So don't get too upset, folks, okay? (laughs) And I don't know if this is controversial, but what I'm going to say is, I'm going to say, go titanium or steel baffles. Don't go aluminum baffles. And I, I know I just alienated a bunch of products. So if you're listening, you make a silencer with aluminum baffles, don't hate me. I'm just saying that this person's asking me what factors to consider, and I'm telling you, maybe maybe don't 
eliminate aluminum from, from the baffle material, but I'm going to tell you what I'm personally, uh, I, I personally favor. And, you know, I, the reason I say this is because it's way easier to clean 22 silencer baffles with really harsh chemicals or an ultrasonic. Like, I, I'm i just going to tell you. I mean, yeah, you can pin tumble things and, you know, media tumble. But, come on, man. Like, you know what you want to do. You want to use uh, you want to use chemistry, don't you? Or you want to use ultrasonic. You want to you want to like a simple, you know, thing. And you what what you don't want to deal with if you shoot a lot is having a mess with testing your cleaning methods with aluminum to see if you're going to damage the baffles or not. Like that's a pain in the butt. Like I just, I've been there, done that, dude. Like I've shot enough to where I'm like, yeah, you can you can pre treat your baffles with like a variety of greases or oils or whatever, but it's a pain in the butt. Like, in my opinion, it, or it can be. So it's like, yeah, I think. So that's the first thing I would say you should consider is baffle material. Just think about that. I think it's worth thinking about. Now, another thing to think about would be uh, the method of disassembly. Okay. Like, and, and how and how easy or hard, or how easy or difficult is it to disassemble? You know, and, and this goes into cleaning because, and, and I'm going to harp on this because clean, cleaning a 22 silencer is one of the most important things for the 22 silencer. In, unless you barely shoot it, and I'm t- and, and and you know you may you may not clean it a lot because you may and you may not shoot a lot, and that's okay. But but I'm telling you, the amount of lead in carbon deposits is going to be significant, and m- a lot of lead. You, you're going to vaporize that lead; it's going to stick to every surface in that silencer. There's n- there's no way around it, um, and you know. It just it doesn't matter if the barrel is long or short. I mean, it can increase depending on some factors, but it, it's going to happen. And you you will you will fill up a silencer with lead if you shoot enough. So please try to clean the silencer before that happens. <laughs> you, you should see some pictures of some twenty two silencers after really really high la- round counts, or God forbid, auto full auto fire. You're going to fill up your silencer pretty good there. So yeah. Clean it before that happens. You want to follow the follow the recommended cleaning schedule from the manufacturer. You know, it really depends on the silencer. Could be five hundred rounds, could be a thousand. I I don't know. It I don't know. I wouldn't go too long um, on a twenty two silencer. It just depends. Depends on the gun. Depends on the silencer. Okay, so you're gonna have to reach out to the folks to get that info. So so those those are the two. I think those are those are the main two things. I think. You know, uh, you know, you're asking, sir, ma'am, uh, what factors to consider. I think I would consider those two. I, I also, if I were you, I'd probably look for something with high sound suppression performance. And I will admit, I I don't have much 22 data on the website right now because it's not an area I've been focusing on. Sorry, I haven't haven't published that. A lot of them going to be really quiet, and that's the great thing about 22. It's one of the best platforms to suppress. It's probably the best platform. It's probably the best platform to suppress. You know, overall, out of all the suppressed small arms you could possibly get, Rimfire is probably the best because of the sound and the cost of, of use. The silencers are cheaper, the ammo's cheaper, and it's the quietest. So, you know, a Bolt Action 22, for example, is probably one of the coolest things to own. Like, not only as, like, a gun guy, but, like, as a human being. Okay? Like, come on, man. So... Um, but I will say, not all 22 silencers are created equal, you know, and having a loud 22 silencer with a loud first round pop kind of sucks because you want 22, 22 to be really quiet. That's what you want. Okay. Because it's one of the few suppressed systems that can really be, you know, so-called Hollywood quiet. When, when people say Hollywood quiet and they're not blowing smoke up your butt, um, they should really be talking about the 22 because that's what. Hollywood quiet is and what you need to be doing is or or you know any sub really any subsonic cartridge from a bolt action but 22 can be like ridiculous and quiet so one thing to look for and you can use your your silencer knowledge one thing to look for is look for a, a d- discrete baffle silencers a lot of mono older monocore silencers there they can be gr- they can be good but chances are sometimes they can have some um 
a lot of signature components, especially first round pop, just because of the access of all of the the internal air of the silencer to the rest of the stack. It's just not as efficient in quenching that first round pop. Um, you know, the, the monocores that actually perform better, they're, they're usually pretty complex. And those are going to be from folks like Liberty, Liberty Suppressors, who um, some of you folks may not know. So some of you guys that have been in the game for a while know about uh, Dave and Liberty Suppressors there. Um, he he makes some really intricate monocores. Um, they're really not widely pro proliferated like a lot of other popular stuff, though, uh, but very unique. Um, I'd say by and large, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna want really efficient cones, probably maybe some K baffles or something. I don't know. Maybe you get some Omega baffles on in some stuff are cool. So, some kind of highly restrictive baffle design that travels traps a lot of gas. Okay, on, on 22 sensors, you want to trap gas. That's what you're doing. The goal is to be as quiet as possible. Now, when it comes to weapon operation, you know, semi-auto 22 weapons, they're usually blowback operated. Okay, that's just the nature of them. They're because of the because of the energy of the cartridge, um, it is by its nature. The weapon design allows for more simple operation because dealing with that energy is easy with simple from simple means, meaning spring resistance and inertial resistance. Okay, um, that that's why twenty two weapons are usually cheap because they can be lighter. The the, the the they don't have to be built. You know they have to don't be as overbuilt. You know, to contain the ha pressure hazards and the reciprocating system, if it's semi-auto, does not have to be as complex. Typically, like you're not going to use a gas system, for example. You, you use straight blowback, and um, and it's going to work relatively well, and it can be pretty reliable in that way as well. Now, um, and and it should be noted that uh, rimfire ammunition can be relatively inconsistent. Um, so you know, you want to stick with something like CCI standard velocity, some high quality, twenty two ammo. Um, now. I will say, because they're blowback operated, you know, if you have something with really light reciprocating mass that isn't like, um, I shouldn't say that isn't designed for sonic use because none of them are, but the the what what that what that could do is your silencer because it has flow restriction or back pressure, like we talk about all the time, um, it will introduce a port pop on the straight blowback weapon. This is the same thing as port pop on an AR. It's just a more simple mechanism. This is why we don't use direct blowback systems for nine millimeter and we like uh, delayed blowback like the, 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 the HK roller delayed blowback or the CMMG radial delayed blowback. Um, so on 22, you don't really have those options. You're probably gonna be straight blowback. So um, th there are some ways around that. And you can add mass. Actually, I've done that. I, I've added mass to a Ruger Mark III bolt, um, and, and and with certain silencers, it can make man, it can make that whole system quieter. It can be kind of cool. You have to play with that. Uh, you can even hold the hold the Ruger bolt back uh, close with your thumb when you shoot, you make it really quiet. Just then you have to manually cycle it. Um, there's slide locks and things like that for other types of pistols. You can do that. Uh, you know, it, uh, uh, I don't know about tuning a tuning a, a 22 pistol or reciprocating system for for silencer use that might be a little overkill there, there are also some silencers for 22s that have a little higher flow rate than some others you can play and balance that 22 is supposed to be quiet so that's something that that i think we should get into at pew science sometime when we can have some fun maybe when we get some more time i can do that but i hope this helps for now these are just some things to think about um i think just I think maybe just as important as your silencer factors you're asking about, sir or ma'am, are your host factors. Remember, um, many silencer consumers, new and old, pursue really cool silencers, and then they shop for hosts later. I know that's always not always practical, but that is the silencer game. That's right. All right, thank you for that question. Question 228, sub-question 31. Any predictions on when the next tech plateau will be? Or will anything we buy be obsolete by the time the stamp clears? Man, doom and gloom. <laughs> Let me get a drink of water one second. 
<laughs> Doom and gloom. No, that's a good question. Actually, you asked you you asked yes two two questions. So your first question. Uh, any predictions on the on when the next tech tech plateau will be? Hmm. Next tech plateau. I I think I know what it is. I would say it, it, it's it's got to be balancing suppression and flow rate for supersonic rifle. It's got to be. We're gonna hit that sometime. We're gonna hit it. I, I think we're gonna hit it within the next year or two. I think we really are. Um, we'll see. Um, I think it's got to be that. I that's what I'm seeing being driven by military requir- requirements at least. That 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 um, that tech. And, and that's what I'm seeing will proliferate into consumer tech more than it already has. That's what I think. I think that's what that's what we're seeing. I think I think there are some co- companies that are doing pretty advanced R and D, and I I hope that I can be a fly on the wall for some of that because it's 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 a really exciting time to be a silencer consumer. You guys, oh, I am. I keep saying it's it's the golden age of silencers, and oh, you know what? Shout out, powerful Jimmy Bell. Formerly of Sonsor Co. Now he runs uh, Texas Ordnance Depot in in uh, in Texas. Uh, Pew Science member. He's a really great guy. I interviewed him on this podcast at NRA annual meetings, maybe in like 2017 or something. I don't remember when we when I interviewed him. Maybe it was 20. I don't. When was that that I interviewed him on this podcast? That was before I started Pew Science, I think. Wasn't it? It was. And back then, he said, we're living in the golden age of silencers. I think that was back when he worked for Silencer Co. Yeah, that was one of the early episodes of this podcast. Um, He's right. He's right. We, we're, we are living in the golden age of silencers, and and it's exciting. And I'm excited about that tech, that balancing suppression and flow rate. Man, that's fascinating to me. I've tested so much stuff. That the OSS, is, or I'm sorry, the Huxwork stuff is just, how? I know how, but but how did they persevere? Because they knew it was going to work eventually, and they kept trying, and they kept trying, and they kept trying. They tried, and, they, and every time they tried, they did a little better, and a little better, and a little better, until they finally succeeded at an amazing product. And is it perfect? Absolutely not. Does it do what they intended? I think so. And that's crazy to me. You know what I mean? So yeah, that's my answer to your first question. Second question was, <laughs> or will anything we buy be obsolete by the time the stamp clears? <laughs> Man, it's like, Say, oh, I shouldn't get this car because new ones come out next model year. Uh, well, I don't know. With, with regard to things being obsolete soon, I mean, I don't know. To go along with my first, with the answer to the first question, I'd say one could argue some rifle silencers, some rifle silencers being sold right now are already obsolete uh, because they're using older tech that that has been surpassed by newer stuff. Okay, and if you can get adequate flow rate with adequate suppression from a mo- from a modern design and an older design is compromising on one or both of those parameters in accordance with your needs, okay, for your use case, then I think one could argue those sensors are are already obsolete for you. I think I think that's what I would argue. You know, and if they're if they're obsolete for you, they're probably obsolete for many, I would say, you know, you know, that's one thing to consider, you know, one man's trash is another man's treasure. Yeah. People still shoot the B and T TP nine, you know, <laughs> shots fired. Uh, next. I uh, thank you for that question, sir, man. I hope that hope that helps. <laughs> I mean, get in trouble. <laughs> question. <laughs> I'm just picturing BT listening to this. Like, he, what did we do to him? You didn't do anything. I'm just, this is all good fun. I own one, so don't come at me too hard. Question 229, sub question 32. What's the ideal muzzle device design for a QD setup? How, do we, how are we doing on time? Hold on a second. Before I, about an hour in. Oh, that's fair enough. Okay. Okay, this is the last question. <laughs> 
how dare you ask something so in depth? No, I'm just kidding. Um, okay, what what's the ideal muzzle muzzle device design for QD setup? Ideal, yeah, you guys, you guys, and your optimization desires. Yeah, this question is really involved. Yeah, ideal. You know, I'm not sure I can answer that on this podcast without, you know, taking way more than the time remaining. Um, you know, ideal for you may not be ideal for someone else. I will say that. And you're asking about QD. So um, I assume you mean secondary latch retention too. I mean, I, I don't know. I really don't know what you mean. But I will make some assumptions. And then I'm going to give you some things to think about on my personal list. How's that? <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to, let me run down my list. Let me think about this. Okay. I, I, I like repeatable mounts. Okay. I like repeatable position. So an indexed key notch. I've, I've, I've come to like that. Where can you get something like that? You get, you get it, you get it on a Surefire RC2. All the Surefire sensors, right? You get it on the the, the the Knight's Armament, QDCs, right? You know what I'm talking about, right? The, the mount has a little machined bar, or in the case of the KAC, it has a pin, and it indexes on the in, in the blast chamber of the silencer. You can only put it on one way, and then you tighten the you tighten the collar or latch. Okay, so the silencer doesn't screw on. The silencer gets put on the, the, the system the same in the same. It's clocked the same way every time. And then you tighten the latch. Okay, the silencer is in the exact same position rotationally every time you use it. I like that it's for a QD. So that's one that's one thing that's cool. Um, secondly, I like the secondary retention that I just talked about. I like the mechanical fail safe. Um, it lets me know the system's attached and locked. Big fan of that. Uh, something I like. It's just something I like. It's it's more foolproof. The silencer doesn't loosen. It doesn't loosen. And 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 you ask QD. I'm not ta- I'm not saying it's better than direct thread. Direct thread is a special case. You need to you need to make sure your direct thread silencer is attached tightly enough, which is fine, and a lot of people like that for the simplicity, but what I'm saying is if it's QD, then I want secondary retention on it, okay? Why? Because QD means quick, quick detach, quick attach, and if it's like that, well, then I want to be able to make sure that the latch uh, is is on there so it's not going to come off. Now, you can use a taper for direct thread, but again, we're talking QD. We're not talking about direct thread, are we? And frankly, um, with tapered threading, do, is the sensor really clocked the same each time when it's tightened, or is it a little off? I know technically it's a little off. Uh, it might be kind of close, but it's, it's never going to be like an index notch. Um, another thing I like, and this goes this goes into secondary retention. Another thing I like is the visual indication of the mechanical failsafe being activated. And it has to be simple to use. Okay, that's something I like. Like if something is... Um, oh, uh, well, here we go. I have something on my desk. Let me try something really quick. Okay, so I have the Surefire silencer. I'm going to unlock the mount collar. I have a, I just happen I just happen to have this on my desk right now. So I'm going to put this silencer mount in the RC2. Okay, so it's all the way in there. Now I'm going to rotate the mount. I guess there's not really a visual indication that the RC2 is locked, is there? I guess I rotated it all the way. It's kind of hard not to not to not to do that. I mean, it's literally a and then and then with with the Surefire silencer, you do that and then you wiggle the silencer, and make sure it's tight, and it it is. It does not shoot down range unless you want it to. So that's easy peasy lemon squeezy on that one. Um, I unfortunately don't have the QDC silencers with me anymore i had to give those back to the, to the wonder wondrous consumer that, that lent them to me but the the qdc has a has a um um a uh, mount latch collar thing that that screws that in, pushes ball bearings into the silencer uh, mount um that's really cool so that one 
those um, you can kind of visually see because the mount collar comes back over everything, but also you're, it's almost foolproof. That mount's almost foolproof. Um, the, I have, uh, oh, I have a, I have a, I have a rugged sensor on my desk. Um, this one, you know, that those mounts, like the visual indication is actually not easy to see. So that's one thing I don't like about the rugged system. Um, but the, also the rugged system actually, uh, has, has some other flaws too that aren't, aren't severe, but are there. Um, so yeah, the, um, so the visual indication, the mechanical failsafe being activated is cool. Knowing, knowing, like in a perfect world, I would be able to see that. I mean, the rugged actually, the rugged does have that because it has the go the 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 go no go thing on their mount. I just oh, do I have not have a rugged mount in front of me though? I have the sensors to have a mount. Yeah. Um. So those those mounts do that, um, which is kind of cool. That the, they they have that feature. Um. What else? What else do I like about QD? Um. Oh. I like it when it doesn't add significant weight to the silencer. Like if it's built in, like the Surefire is like, it's things built into it. Like the rugged things built in. I know the Sandman series is built in. Um, so you really don't know what you're missing unless you try to add it to another, like a universal hub mount silencers. You're trying to add a QD system. You, you, you I guess you can sort of compare the weights. I, I don't think you need significant weight for it. And I think if you do have significant weight and, and you have significant length or something, I think that that seems less than ideal to me. So uh, you're, you're asking, uh, sir, man, what's the ideal muzzle device designed for a QD setup? Well, obviously not something that's super heavy and, and long because <laughs> that wouldn't be ideal at all. Yeah. And, and, and uh, what else? Oh, strength i think i always I always come back to this i want i want it to be strong if it's qd you know using the qd system in my this is my this is just jay talking this is in my opinion using the qd system should in no way reduce the pressure capacity of the silencer okay i and let me say that like in a different way the mount system should work in the Entire design envelope of the silencer itself. So if if you're shooting a silencer on a gun and you're allowed to put a certain pressure into it for a certain duration, so a silencer company has told you um, you thou shall not use the silencer on a 308 barrel length shorter than 12 inches then the mount you choose to put on that silencer should not change that answer. And I can tell you right now, with the proliferation of third-party mounts and these universal backends, you better hope, <laughs> you better hope that these mount companies have have done their designs correctly. Because if you if if you're if you're if one of your uh Sponsors that you buy has a sponsor manufacturer that says, "Oh, no barrel length restrictions," and you put a mount in the back that isn't strong enough, and you blow up and you blow out, blow up your mount and your sponsor launches. Well, that's not the, the fault of the sponsor manufacturer; that's the mount manufacturer's fault. So, that's the one thing that I think why still some manufacturers haven't gone to universal mounting. So it's a it's a potential issue, and I'm not I'm not sure that some of these mount companies even even know how to calculate that so i'm not saying they're bad i'm just saying i don't know okay so i hope that helps i know that's a lot um i'm gonna go ahead and i'm going to highlight that question i'm gonna stop there i'm gonna i'm gonna highlight that question in our spreadsheet boom okay that was great I think we get, we did pretty good. We didn't get super far, but I think there was a, some pretty comprehensive answers, and I think we're doing pretty good on time. So I'm going to go ahead and save that, and I'm going to close the spreadsheet. Okay, thanks thanks for asking those questions. Uh, we still have, I'm scrolling down in the spreadsheet. We have, oh my God, actually. I got to do these more often. We might have to start to add these to every episode. Okay, yeah, I'm going to have to do that. Yeah, this is, this is, this is, this is going to have to start to be a recurring thing because this is ridiculous. There are way too many. Oh my God. Now I'm scared. Okay. We're closing it. Don't be scared. Don't be scared, homie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. We're going to move into topic four, a time of one hour, nine minutes. 
in 37 seconds. Okay, topic four. Yeah, really eye-opening meetings this past weekend. I don't even know how to describe that without giving some things away, but you know, the, the support for peace science is non-trivial and it, it, it's tangible and all the people that support it, the companies, the entities, the consumer supporters, you're all amazing. And I, I really wanted to specifically talk about Swiss CNC, you know, because they're they're a Pew Science corporate member and they're an incredible manufacturer. And I think I think they they deserve mention, and they're, and they're not mentioned a lot because they're they're sort of a, like a, a a behind the scenes player, but they're responsible for a lot of great things. Let me get a drink of water one second. Yeah, so <clears throat> like I said in topic one today. Um, one of the main reasons I went to NRA this year was touch points, and it, it's important to see folks in person sometimes. I think it's I think it's invaluable. I, I, I'm a people person, but also but besides that, I I do think it's important to to to, to talk man to man, um, or or man to woman, as it were. Um, I, I don't want to blow blow up anyone's spot, uh, but, but some of the th- things people told me. About this effort and about Pew Science were so incredibly heartwarming. <laughs> I kind of blushed and I was like, I couldn't believe some of this. I was like, that is so cool. It was really cool. And it, it was boots on the ground seeing people talk about the benefits of the effort. And it was really cool. And the effort that all of you listening are supporting, okay, seeing that talked about in the wild, it was really motivating. Like for me personally, like it fuels me. I was like, yes, it's working. Let's do this. It's going to be awesome. That's, that's, that's part of the reason why I buckled down and was able to write two articles like in the span of like no days just to like get stuff out to you. I mean, I could have easily skipped this week, you know, and not giving you anything, you know, publish anything. But I was, I'm, I'm freaking motivated, man. I really feel like this is a team effort. It, it, the industry is on board with this now. I am really excited. Like people are complimentary of all of you. That's how I see it. If, when people compliment Pew Science, that means they're complimenting all of you. Okay, because you wouldn't be listening to this if you weren't part of it. All right, well, which is really cool. And so what I did on Saturday morning, what I did, I took a, a detour. <laughs> uh, wait, was it Friday morning or Saturday morning? What did I do? Wait a minute. I My days are running together. No, 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 no. Wait. It was Friday morning. How was that possible? Wait, how many days was I at things? Friday? Saturday. Yeah, Friday morning. I'm sorry, I'm like I'm I'm losing time. I headed north of Houston and I visited Swiss CNC. Okay. Uh I'm not sure if you folks know who that is and you may not. You ve- you very well may not uh because they do zero z- 0.0 marketing and 0.0 advertising. Okay? They do not market or advertise their services. They are a highly technical and skilled manufacturer. Okay? And when I say that, I I, I am using those words <laughs> emphatically. Okay? They are highly technical and skilled at what they do. And they make many types of things. They do. And, and one of the things, and they have made many types of things and do. One of the things they make is silencer parts. That's right. They do. Chances are none of you have heard about them. Um, specifically mounts. So I guess you technically, if you want to, you know, mounts is one of the things they make. Um, I can tell you that the quality of their manufacturing is so high that it, if you take a, a well-known silencer mount, made by them and you take the same exact mount made by somebody else and hold them in your hand like side by side like in front of your face a lot of times you can tell the difference and i i bet you nine times out of ten 
I, I can pick out if there's a difference. I can pick out the better one. <laughs> I'm telling you, it it's that drastic to me. I'm now, and and this is a little known fact about manufacturing. Chances are. The folks who designed your silencer are not the folks that make the parts for the silencer. I mean, that's just, it's not the same all the time, but it's the same a lot of, a lot of the time. A lot of the time, you know, some of these things are being made by job shops, okay? And and I just want to shout out Swiss CNC. They are one of the good ones. They have been a supporting corporate member of Pew Science since the early days. Uh, they're awesome. If you're listening, guys, stay awesome. You're incredible, your whole team. Um, yeah, I think I just wanted to shout you out to all the people listening because I know you don't market and everything, but you know, I figured, hey, if there's any folks that are listening that need manufacturing services and they need things made, Swiss CNC is a company that can do that for you. And I would be happy to put you in touch with them. If you are so inclined, okay, that's just me doing a solid for some awesome guys, okay? They're great. And with that, I will end this episode. That's right. Uh, stay tuned for data this week. Uh, it may be slightly controversial. <laughs> I, I think I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know. I'm, I'm doing my best. to. I'm doing right. I'm doing what I know is right. And in doing so, I hope that it helps. And inevitably... There will be issues. But despite that, persevere and continue with the effort as planned from the very beginning. Okay? So stay safe today. Stay safe. Stay safe out, stay safe out there. I think that's important. I, um, given all the recent events that are occurring in the world, Please take that to heart when I say it. It's, it's not routine that I say it. I, I do mean it when I say it. So I will talk with you folks again soon. All right, bye.